I want to welcome you guys to this program, uh, Hummingbirds, Bees and Butterflies. Basically, what, how to do it, set up your backyard, your front yard, your side yard, whatever it is. My name is Dane. I'm the circulation librarian here at Rogers. Some of you may know me from the hikes. Some of you may know me from some of the other programs that are on HCTV. And I am available for autographs later. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So anybody who knows me knows I'm big on the environment. I love the outdoors. I love the hike. I like the fish. I like to camp. I like the whitewater raft. I like the outdoors. The outdoors are part of my life. So I try to do whatever these little things I can to help the environment, whether it's setting up something like this, or just educating people on the environment in general. I love doing that. I've done it all my entire life. But have you ever looked at your neighbor's yard and then looked at your yard <laughs> and said to yourself, what the heck am I doing wrong? Their yard's full of flowers. They got vegetables growing up. They got palm trees in New Hampshire. You know, you can't grow a weed. Your lawn is so bad, your yard is so bad, you don't even have rocks. That's how bad it is. But take a good look at it. And I really didn't realize how bad my yard was until I looked at my neighbors who had like this classic English garden. And I'm like, what in the world? But I paid attention to it. At first, I foo-fooed it like an English garden. What are you doing here, you know? You're on the wrong side of the pond. Nothing personal, Sheila. Uh, and so, <laughs> so anyway, but I looked at it. And they had mixed in the flowers with the vegetables, with the... There's trellises with all these things growing all over it. And there was bees and butterflies and hummingbirds and everything you could imagine in there. And I'm like, that's the trick. Pollinators. Pollinators. You have to have pollinators. You can have the best seed, the best soil, the best everything, but if you don't have pollinators, it doesn't work. Anybody who's grown squash, how many times you get out there and you see the, that big blossom of that squash blossom and you're going, yeah. And then it goes and dies. And you said, okay, flower dies, fruit soon appears, right? Nothing happens. It's because it never got pollinated. For whatever reason, it didn't get pollinated. If it doesn't get pollinated, it will not produce fruit. So pollinators are important. Now, I gave you some pamphlets to look at. And we're talking about hummingbirds. Does, let's, let's take hummingbirds just as the first one, because it's the smallest category. How many different species of hummingbirds do we normally get here in New Hampshire? Ninety-nine point nine percent of the hummingbirds you see in New Hampshire are ruby-throated, and not, every now and then a rufus will come in, but for the most part, no. But most of them are are, are uh, ruby-throated. Now you see that little bird, and it's beating its wings at like nine hundred miles an hour. They migrate from Central America to here and back again. To get, go that distance, can you imagine how f those wings? Pound for pound, they're probably the strongest bird out there. But they use a lot of energy. They burn a ton of energy. So they eat, they need that nectar from the, from the flowers 
to fuel them. It's like it's like being drink a soda, and then you you like you you ant. That's them. But they also eat insects and everything else along the way. Bees. Anybody have an idea of the number of different species of bees that we have? Hundreds of them. Most of us think of the honeybee. The honeybee is not native to our area. It is naturalized, but it's not native, meaning our environment has learned to adapt, or the honeybee has learned to adapt to us. And a lot of the crops that we plant and different flowers that we use are not native to our area either. So those are what the, the honeybee are going for, because deep down in its genetics, it's going for these different flowers. But the plants that are native to us, things like uh, rhododendrons, azaleas, uh, uh, let's see, blueberries, cranberries, we have native bees that go to those things all the time. Squash bees. There are such things as squash bees. They're these little tiny suckers. And they're, what they're programmed to do is a squash blossom will blossom at like just as the sun is coming up in the morning. These bees are programmed to hit that blossom at that time. Honeybees don't wake up until later. They're like a, like a teenager. They wake up like around noon. All right? The blossom is already passed, so they're not, the honeybees aren't going to hit your squash blossoms. Bumblebees. There are like, I don't know how many varieties of bumblebees. The honeybee is the only bee that produces a hive that you can harvest the honey from. There's no other bee that does that. Now bees are not to be confused with wasps and hornets. What's the difference between a wasp, a hornet, and a bee? What's that? They're mean. Okay. They hold on to their stinger when they sing That's a that's a characteristic. That's a characteristic. They are derived from the same ancestor. Bees, wasps, hornets, they're all derived from the same ancestor. But in that chain, they broke apart. Bees are vegetarians. Wasps and hornets are predators. There are wasps and hornets that will attack a beehive and kill everything inside of it. And they're very territorial, and it doesn't take much to tick them off. Yellow jackets fall into that hornet's thing. Believe me, I've had my share of run-ins with yellow jackets. So, butterflies. Now, I'm going to include moths in the butterfly category. I don't even ask me how many different species there are of those things. They're all over the place. And they're probably, out of the three, the mo in my mind, the most important out of them all. Because with the exception of the monarch, which is milkweed oriented, butterflies and moths will land on anything and feed off it. So the mo they're the most versatile of them all. They're not specialized. A lot of bees are specialized for certain things. I mean, I, I have a rhododendron plant that there are times in the summer you go out there and it sounds like it's vibrating. There are so many bumblebees in the thing. And some of those littler bees that, you'll, you, that are listed on that pamphlet. So, but butterflies are all over the place, butterflies and moths. So what this is about is, this is not a, a, a lesson in the different types of these, these critters. It's about what you need to do to, to attract them. 
So the very first thing you want to do is look at the big picture. What, did anybody get an idea what I mean by look at the big picture? There's a couple of different ways you can look at that. How about the area that you have to work with? If you live in a development that says you can't have this, you can't have that, you can't have this, you can't have that, you can't breathe, you can't do anything, does that mean you can't attract pollinators? No. A simple plant in a pot will attract a pollinator. Do you have room to plant all sorts of rhododendrons, blueberries, all sorts of fruiting plants, crab apples, all this other stuff in your yard? If you do, great. If you can plant one, great. But looking at the big picture means looking at the environment as a whole. Because it's a circle, folks. One feeds off the other, which feeds off the other, which feeds off the other. We are part of that circle. But in this realm, you want to arrange your area to be as attractive to multiple species as you can because they each will benefit off the other. Bears are pollinators. Deer are pollinators. Rabbits, squirrels are pollinators. Other birds are pollinators. I witnessed a Cooper's hawk picking off a rabbit this morning on their way into work. Greatest thing I've seen in my life. It was, a, it was neat and I didn't have my camera. So, that Cooper's hawk is a pollinator now because he hit the ground to pin that rabbit. Any type of pollen that was coming off any of those plants there is now in his wings. He's carrying that someplace else. What about the pollen, seeds, whatever that were in that rabbit? Now they're being transferred all over. See, you gotta look at the big picture. So it's the pollinators are not just these three different things that we're looking at, it's everything. The wind pollinates. So you have to look at the big picture. So you want to be able to attract multiple species, not just these three. Number two is be realistic. If you have a 50 foot square diameter spot, you can't plant an orchard. Do what you can. Small groups of plants. Now in that pamphlet I, get, I gave you, it gives you some different plants that you can do, you can use. I've, I've mentioned rhododendrons, azaleas, blueberries, any of your burying plants. Um, apples, though apples are not native to us either, but they've been naturalized. A lot of your annuals will, will attract them, but number four, I'll skip three, I'll go to number four. Stay native as, as native as possible. Because that pretty flower that comes from who knows where originally, you plant it in, the, in our ground and next thing you know it becomes an invasive species and it takes over everything. Because every place where these plants come from, there's, a, there's an enemy of that plant. Just like with wildlife. We can, we can bring in whatever type of animal and if it gets loose, if it doesn't have a natural enemy, it's out of control. Look at the pythons down in the Everglades. There's no natural enemy to these pythons. So they take over everything. The same can happen with plants, Japanese knotweed, for example. 
ornamental. It was brought in as an ornamental. Somebody said, hey, I want to keep, that's a pretty looking plant, blah, blah, blah. It's gone. And we have no natural ways of killing it. In the countries that it comes from, there are bacterial stuff in the soil and stuff that may limit it. But here it's like free range because there's nothing to, to get it. It's like the uh, emerald ash borer beetle. The, the, the elm, the elm, it, it hits the elms and, and, and things that, and the ash trees. It's, it comes from Asia. We have no natural predator to take care of it. So this, that's why you, you stick to native as much as possible. But the native, again, it goes back to those bees and butterflies that are used to native plants. <clears throat> you plant more native, you're going to get more, more attention. A lot of the annuals, they don't, they're annuals because they die. They may, a hundred miles south of here, they may, become, they may be considered perennials. But up here, they're annuals. The, the bees, the butterflies and stuff, they're not used to that stuff. So, a little goes a long way. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take much. Now, I'm going to be gifting to the library a hummingbird feeder and stand, and I'm going to be putting it out there. I guarantee you we're going to get visitors. Play, the thing is going to be full of, because it, it doesn't take much. The next one, it says plant in layers. And I actually wrote it twice. So plant in layers. What do I mean by plant in layers? Yes, exactly. Low, up, 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 up. Gives them a variety. It's like going to the all-you-can-eat buffet and having iceberg lettuce, and that's it. But you have the, all the different varieties, which is what these layers are. But these layers also provide cover. Because those hummingbirds, they're going at like 900 miles an hour, fly, flapping their wings. They need the rest. And they'll sit down on, the, on some of these branches higher up in the, to keep them, because that said Cooper Hawk, he's looking for a snack. And he will take those out. And when they're sitting down, they're sitting ducks. So they will hide themselves in some of those branches. Now, all wildlife including us, we need food, water, and shelter. So if you, in your thing, be realistic, look at the big picture, a little goes a long way, you put a bird feeder out there, I mean a bird bath, put a bird bath, you plant the right plants, and you, and you do the layer thing, now you've just provided them food, shelter, and water you're going to have a lot of happy campers. Unless you have deer and bear coming in knocking down your bird bath all the time, which I do. I'm constantly out there doing it. You can always tell when they come by. Like the, the birds and the squirrels, they sit there and they take a little drink and they, and they go on and the thing still says, bear. <laughs> it's like, you know, he gets a drink, he knocks it over for everybody else. You know, he, doesn't like, he doesn't play nice. So you've got that. You stay late. Another thing is if you've got the property and you do brush cleaning, throw that brush in a pile at the edge of your property, way in the back, someplace where it's not noticeable to the neighbors who get all ticked off. They don't like you cleaning a deer either in the deer. Just to, just to let you know. The, but the, the brush pile, you'll attract all sorts of critters. Now, someone here this morning, this earlier on, before we even started this thing, said, "What can I do about the rabbits?" <laughs> that brush pile 
Well, how's Fox? The fox will take care of your rabbits for you. They also take care of the neighbor's cat, <laughs> just, to make you, just to make you aware. But they, it is cover for them. I had a family, a gray fox. I had a brush pile. And I was one morning, it was in the spring, and it was one, I had the windows open. It was one of those warm mornings, and I was laying in bed, and I hear this thing, it sounds like puppies. And I'm like, oh, what idiot threw puppies out the, you know, some, someone who didn't want their dogs or something. So I get dressed, I go outside with a flashlight, and I'm looking around, and all of a sudden, these fox kits go charging up to me. And I'm like, okay, mom and dad are somewhere near here. I raise the flashlight, and there's mom and dad looking at me like they were going to rip my throat out. And I'm like, they're your kids. I didn't do anything. You take care of them. It's like, every time I tried to back away, the puppies are It's like, get away from me, kid, you know. But I didn't have any rabbit problems. The family of Gray Fox took care of them. So that's how the circle works, though. If you don't have any predators, you're going to have the rabbits. You had mentioned about things you planted and they got eaten alive, right? Everything got eaten? You need predators to take out the chipmunks, the squirrels, the rabbits. They're not going to get them all, but they're going to they're going to keep them ducking. I mean, if you if you have a hawk every now and then coming down picking someone off, the squirrel's going to be going. He's not going to be looking at your stuff. He's going to be like, "Oh, I got to get out of here. Can't keep can't stay out here long." But if there's nothing eating them, <laughs> what are you going to do? So that's why you need, that's why that circle thing, that's why you have to put up all this, because they all interact with each other. Now, to make all this work, I've listed five other things. Let me just start out by saying I hate lawns. I hate lawns, I hate lawns, I hate lawns, I hate lawns. They have no purpose in life. Unless you're raising sheep. If you're raising sheep or cattle, great, have a lawn. Fine. But how much effort do you put into a, a lawn? You gotta mow it, you gotta water it, you gotta keep it a certain height. I mean, if you keep it, if you let it grow too long, the those same neighbors they're gonna come over and they're gonna get on your case for that. If you want this stuff to work for wildlife, especially the hummingbirds, the bees, and the butterflies, limit your lawn. Cut it down. Because just like I don't like lawns, neither do they. Now, that's not to mistake your lawn for clover. Now, if you have white or red clover growing, I have convinced my wife that is called lawn. I let that stuff grow all over the place. It's, dear, it's grass with flowers on it. It's nice, isn't it? Leave it. Because bees love it. Butterflies love it. Hummingbirds, nah, not so much. But it's, just let it go to, let it go to that. Again, we've talked about providing cover. Cover can be anything. It can be birdhouses. I mentioned down feeders and houses, bird houses, shrubs, like a, th a hedge, a hedgerow it is perfect cover for all these little birds and butterflies and things of that nature. Provide food and water, limit your fertilizer, herbicides, and pesticides. Every pesticide you spray out there, I don't care what you're spraying it for. You could be spraying it for gypsy moths. You could be spraying it for the wasp's nest. You can be doing all this stuff. You're going to be killing other things besides that. 
your herbicides, your Roundups in the world. They are not picky about what they kill. You spray it on something, you overspray it, you've just killed plants. That you, might have, you might have just spent 50, 60, 70 dollars at the garden store, brought back this whole thing of plants, spent the Sunday afternoon planting it, stepped back, looked at it, and said, this place looks beautiful. I'm going to take a picture. Oh, there's a weed there. <laughs> Go on, next day you come out and get your camera. Yeah, I'm going to take a picture. There's a big old dead spot right where your plants were. That stuff, that's how bad that stuff is. Roundup, brought to you by the same people who brought you Agent Orange. A defoliant. It's made to kill anything plant life that's green. No different. So, limit that. Herbicides. What's a, what's a herbicide? Plant killer. Okay, so you got this nice green grass, right? I'm going to put down that fungus killing whatever it is in my, with, the, with the fertilizer. T -t 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 you just wiped out every beneficial plant, organism, plant, whatever, in the area with that stuff. It's non-discriminatory. How about those, uh, anybody, anybody got, um, oh, 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 grubs in your lawn? My lawn, when, when I had a lawn, remember I told my wife the clover was, the, but when I had the lawn, it looked like a mad golfer went through there. You know what that golfer was? Skunk. Best grub prevention tool ever thought of being made. They'll, they'll ferret out grubs left and right. And they'll take care of moles if they can catch them. So they like a multi-purpose thing. <laughs> but you spray that, that grub, X killer, poison stuff all over your lawn, you've now killed every good insect that was in your lawn You've killed every earthworm known to man that ever thought about living in your lawn. You've probably killed a family of skunks who picked up that grub who got poisoned by that stuff. You've, you've basically destroyed everything. Dandelions. Bees love dandelions. And butterflies love dandelions. Dandelions are not native to our country. They were brought over by the Europeans in the, in the little boats there. But, one, they're edible. Two, they are also a, a detoxifier. When you eat them, it's, it detoxifies your, your, your bloodstream and stuff. But do you ever wonder why you see certain lawns that have like nothing but dandelions? What's that telling you? The soil is sick. They're detoxifying that soil. And what they're detoxifying it from is the over-fertilization, the pesticides, and the different herbicides that have been poured into that soil. So you see these people, they put down all this dandelion killing stuff, and, the, and next year they come up and they got more dandelions than they started with? It's because the dandelions are trying to heal the soil by detoxifying it. So don't pick dandelions off your lawn if you're going to eat them. Go find a field someplace that, where they're growing if you're going to eat them. And they've got to be eaten when they're young or they're bitter as heck. But because what you're eating is that they're, they're sucking all the poison out of the soil. So if you ingest that, you're ingesting the poison. That's a lesson my, my mother, the, the healer, taught me. My mother was a native healer. So, don't eat that stuff. One of the many lessons she told me. And some of them I didn't listen to. But, 
When you, the more stuff you're putting into your soil, the more you're killing the soil. The more you're killing the soil, you're putting poison in, you're not going to get the plants to grow. If you're not going to get the plants to grow, you're not going to get the hummingbirds, the bees, and the butterflies to come in and act as the pollinators. If you don't get the pollinators in, you're not going to have crap. Now, this is the part where I open it up to you guys with questions. Because this is not rocket science. It really isn't. It really is not rocket science. I mean, I have my favorite plants that I like to use. You may have some that you're using. That's fine. If they're not native, that's fine too. Just be wary. If you don't keep them in check, they could be in your neighbor's yard too. And your may, neighbor may not be happy. That's the same person who's not happy because your lawn doesn't grow. Anybody have any questions, comments? Yeah? What about ticks? What about ticks? The bane of my life. I hate ticks. Armored spiders. Ticks. The, 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 the bad boy of the arachnid family. Um, The best way to, honestly, the best way to uh, take care of ticks is to, one, mow paths through your grass. Keep your grass cut. If you, have, if you have lawn, keep it cut. If you don't have lawn, use mulch down. Because the idea is that the grass, they, they, if the grass is high enough to hit your ankles, they're going to get you. They also like brush. Yeah. Ticks are inevitable. They're part of the landscape. If you've got chickens, turkeys. ducks, we have turkeys, guinea fowl, we have turkeys. We have turkeys, turkeys. turkeys will eat them. Encur the, again, there's that encouragement of the, of the different wildlife that come through. Yeah, while well, foul birds will pick off ticks left and right. Yeah. Yes. One thing that I found helped is uh, tick tubes. We get them at the garden center, which is just pyrethrin in, in the uh, yeah. That, that really works well for us. And it's just in a tube? It's in a tube, and you put them where you would think a mouse would go. That's what's carrying the ticks, is the mice. And it's an all-natural product, so it doesn't mix in. That's what I need. Paul, I it's not just mice that carry it, though. You've got you to keep in mind, any, they're going to latch on to anything. Yeah, my, dog. my dog. My dog has more ticks than a Timex watch. <laughs> oh, I have to check. We, we, live, we live in a condo um, association. There's hundreds and hundreds of little mounds of dirt mm -hmm. about that big. Moles. <laughs> so those are moles. It's as small as that, and it's like, like right here. It could be like two. It's probably moles. It could be moles. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. They're like the size of a quarter. They could be. Relatively bigger. They, it, it depends what, what it could be. I, I, I would guess moles, and if, that, if not that, then it, it's going to be, it, it, when do you see them? When do you see them the most? Um, they're there all the time. They could. I'm wondering if it was worms. Yeah, I was going to say it could be earthworms too. It could be earthworms too. Yeah, yeah, definitely be a good thing. But have you found any um, way, the best way to get rid of um, poison ivy? Oh. I hate using chemicals, but. It's so bad. It's true. Uh, poison ivy is, is another one of those banes. And it's not, my first word here was limit. Limit your use. Because it goes with that little bit goes a long way. There is poison ivy killer. Read the labels real carefully. 
and see what else it, it's going after, it can, what it will kill. My problem is that I have this, I've cultivated this wild blackberry hedge. And in that blackberry hedge is poison ivy. And I'm severely allergic to poison ivy. Mm -hmm. I got it so bad, I get it systemically every year. I don't even have to get near it. I'll break out in poison ivy. When it gets hot and I start to sweat, mm -hmm. I'll have poison ivy. Even if you don't touch it? Even if I don't touch it. I've got it I got it so bad that I had to, they had to put me on steroids and everything else. And yeah, I was a mess. But yeah, so limit your use. I mean, there's nothing that's going to stop poison ivy, really, except like a chemical. And just, you just use it sparingly and selectively. Yes, sir. I've heard of people rinsing goats. Yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. I've heard the same thing. Public service, or Eversource, or whatever the heck they called now, rents goats and they go down through the, <laughs> along the power lines. But here's the thing with a goat. What goes in's gotta come out. So they eat the poison ivy. And when they, out the other side, you got it, there the seeds are fertilized. So it's great for the goats because it's job security. Because, hey, next year, they're going to have me back. And my kids, too. And my kids. I mean, we're good. We can retire on this job. Not good for the everything else. So you got to, yeah, the good part is, is for a year, it'll be nice and clear. And two years later, it'll be thicker than it was before. Did you mind if we just talk about those ticks you mentioned? Because... I have an elderly dog, and I go Benson's, I will mm -hmm. check everything. He wears one of those, but I don't like, I won't put any chemicals in the yards. He goes out, and so I check him, mm -hmm. and I find the tiny ticks and everything. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that that's okay for it, it won't harm animals, because I have a lot of birds. No, they use some pyrethrin, which is from a yeah. plant. And it's cotton batting that's treated with the pyrethrin. And is it, does it go under the into the it's soil. in like a tube, and you just kind of put it in the yard, where under leaves or something around your yard. We had a lot of ticks, and every year we got, you know, less and less. Is now. it a lick? You put a liquid in, or no, just, it's no? You just put the tube enough. in your yard. They have them at uh, Amazon sells them too, but the guys don't just sell them now. I, I spray, I spray my clothes. I spray my clothes with pyrethrin, mm -hmm. but they also say it's very. Don't get it. It's it. It will. Have, make sure you read the labels. Read the labels real good. But I'm always concerned, you know, with a dog chewing at something like that. There are natural, there are natural um, topical sprays that you can put on that are pump sprays. I don't even like using aerosols. I was thinking in the, in the yard itself. In the yard? But the mice go and grab the cotton batting and make a nest with it. That's right. Oh, so the dog wouldn't be chewing that stuff then. Oh, okay. it could. If it could chew the cotton. Yeah, it can. See, again, that's why, that is why I'm saying be very, very, very careful. Because I honestly don't care what anybody says. There's nothing out there that's 100% safe. And my thought is if they say don't let your kid eat it, I'm not letting my dog get near it, all right? I may let someone else's kid eat it, but <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm kidding you. But my, my dog is like my baby, so it's. I have a picture of what she's talking about. Yeah, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, I probably wouldn't in case, because leave it to him, he'd probably chew it. But the best, okay, here's the thing. But thank you. If you're wearing shoes in your yard and you keep your grass cut down low, in areas that you walk, like if you have like a wooded area, what I've done is I've actually sliced and diced a path through the wooded area that we go through, and I've put bark mulch down on it. If you stay in that area, you're not going to, 
you, potentially you're going to cut down on your tick contact, okay? I made the mistake of I went to North Dakota and I was hiking the Lewis and Clark Trail through North Dakota. And I went through a state park and it was like bushwhacking. Mm -hmm. And I came out the other side and there was a ranger there and he said, Where, did you just come through? And he goes, yeah. He goes, go in the bathroom there and shake, yeah. shake off, shake off. I took my shirt off and I shook it and they had tile floors. You could hear the ticks going, tee, 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 So, no, they're, they're big ticks out west, you know. But is it, are you, is there any way you're going to avoid ticks 100%? No. You can spray for ticks. You can put stuff down on your lawn for ticks. You can do all sorts of stuff for ticks. But then your best bet is, is, to, is to keep your grass cut short. But on the same token, if you want grass, it means you're going to have to water it that much more, and you're going to waste water. So number one, limit the amount of lawn. I mean, you're going to have a little patch right there. You can water it. That's fine. Grow clover. You don't even have to water that stuff. And, go ahead. No, go. Rin's been trying to get a good nectar for hummingbirds. Do you, do you know if there is any good one there? Is it in well, here's the thing. There's, there's been studies out now. Now, this is... This is, I, this is the first I've heard of it this year, it's actually when I was researching to do this for this program. Um, the, the nectar that you buy, you know, in the package, oh, no. that's they, red. I don't like that. Don't, well, they're saying the red dye is bad for the birds. So, <laughs> scratch that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sugar and water. Sugar and water. Yep. Four parts water, one part sugar. Boom. And it doesn't have to be, because hummingbirds, especially ruby-throated hummingbirds, love the colors red and purple, or variations of those. So your feeders are usually red. I use that, and I change it every week, but I don't see the hummingbirds. That's the thing about hummingbirds. You don't always see them. You know, sometimes you got to actually be looking for them. Um, I, I hit one by mistake because I thought it was a bee flying by my head. Oh, no. I, because you hear the wings. Mm -hmm. And I went, whack! And I looked down and went, oh. oh. <laughs> yeah, I just knocked it out. I didn't kill it, thank God. But, but it was like, oh, geez. You give him a little mouth to mouth. <laughs> Pump his chest. But uh, so humming, so red, any, the flowers that they, they also notice they go through the, for the flowers that have the flowers that are shaped like, like trumpets. So they can stick their bill down in there. That doesn't mean they will not take nectar from any other flowers. They just prefer those flowers. Something like a bee balm is I love bee balm, and that's one of the flowers that's listed in there. Cone flower. The cone flower is, is one of the best ones. But every list you see will give you a list of different flowers that they think are the best flowers. Stick, stick some flowers in the yard and see what works. Because... I've never seen a bird or a butterfly or a bee that's read their lists <laughs> yet. So mix it up. See what happens. Ask what other people are doing in your neighborhood. That person that has the great yard, yeah, figure out what they're doing. Sunflowers. Yeah, I love them. They love sunflowers. Daisies. Anything in that, in that family, they love. 
and they're easy to grow. They're like idiot proof. If I can grow it, you can. But daisies will, but that's fine. Well, you just pick them, you snip them and plant other things out. Don't, fa don't be afraid to crowd in your flowers either. Don't be afraid to, to mix up flowers and grasses and, and, and things of that nature. Native grasses, that type of thing. I don't like or ornamental grasses, but I, j I just throw a bunch of stuff in all together. I try to mix up the colors. Get them to bloom at different times of the year. Some plants will bloom really, really early in the spring and then they, they, go, they stay green and stuff. And then you get, the, you get another group that will, by May, June, will be blooming again. So as each one fades, the other one's coming in. That's what's going to keep these pollinators coming in and, because it's like, it's like switching up the all-you-can-eat buffet. But if you have everything blooms at one time, it's a one-hit wonder. They'll sit there and go, man, we ain't going back there. They stop feeding us. We'll fly through, see what that's what they're offering. If they're not, yeah, we're gonna go on. And that's exactly what what happens with this stuff. So packages of wildflower seeds. If you've got the room and can turn up some soil and just throw some wildflower seeds down, something might germinate. All mine did last year, they all did, I think. There you go. And hopefully this year they'll come back, or some of them may come back. Some of them may be annuals, some will, but, yeah. but they may not be too. You never know what's going to come back. I've, had them, I've planted marigolds because I like planting marigolds because deer don't like marigolds. Well, I won't kind of say that because, again, that deer probably didn't read that book because there were some marigolds that were eaten, but I don't know what was eating them. Yeah, it was desperate. But anyway, they say the, for us, marigolds are annuals. I've had them come back. Mums, the same way. They've had them come back. Yeah, they, some of them are biannuals, some of them are annuals, some of them are, are perennials. Perennials are the ones that keep coming back. But I, you can throw stuff in there and see what happens. And, and take it from there. But you want to keep plants that are going to keep flowering. They're going to keep flowering at different times. And you'll save money if you get a perennial, so that, that way you don't have to keep buying them every year. But different flowers flower at different times. Azaleas flower at different times than rhododendrons, even though they're the same family, which flower different than crab apples, which flower different than cherry trees, which flower different than... So if you get a bunch of things that are going, it's, everything's going to keep going, all the different critters. Yeah? What's the um, purpose behind the butterfly houses that they sell? Because a butterfly needs a place to, and to lay their eggs mm -hmm. and to make more butterflies. Usually they, what they will do is uh, butterflies, when butterflies lay their eggs, they will find crevices someplace, they will find in a hollow log someplace, in a clump of grass someplace, because there's things that are going to eat those things. There's, there's animals out there that thrive on caterpillars, so they want to they put as many eggs in hiding someplace so they can populate their species and not have all of them become food. So those butterfly houses, which are basically just like slits, in a in little thingy, and that's the, to mimic that log, that tree branch, whatever. Any other questions? Yeah. What about fertilizers and bulbs and that type of thing in, in gardens, tomatoes and other things? Limit. If you're going to put it for a bulb, you're going to put it in the hole where that bulb is going in? No biggie. Any type of, but if you're going to use a fertilizer, use an organic fertilizer. Don't use a chemical-based fertilizer. Because most of your commercial fertilizers, your orthos and all that stuff, 
they are petroleum-based products. So you're putting a shot into the soil, and yes, it, your plant will grow, but there's a residue that's left in that soil that's poisoning that soil. That's my own personal opinion. I mean, there's science to back that part up, but whether you use it or not, that's your choice. My choice is I go strictly organic as much as possible. You do compost? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Anything else, guys? That's it. We're done. Oh, yeah. I know it's, it's sad, but it's true. Thank you. You're welcome. Feel free to, if you guys go home and say, what the heck did he just, just, you can swing into the library, you can drop me an email, you can do anything you want. I'll answer you as best I can. All right? Thank you. You're entirely welcome. <laughs>